Good morning. It's good to be here today. Thank you to the music team for that music. Uh, there's a, quite a few of us away today uh, at, off at various places over the Easter weekend, and not as many as we normally have, but I felt like that song service, I felt like we had a full church. Um, it was beautiful to sing. I'd like to personally welcome you all today. Um, if there's any new people, visitors, people here for the first time, um, we're glad you could be with us. I'd just like to let you know that you're stepping in on something pretty big. Um, there's around 2.2 billion Christians in the world. That's about one in every three people. And today, or this weekend, uh, Christians around the world are celebrating um, the life death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, we've seen the video to that effect today already and we've been ministered to in many ways. Uh, but that's going to be the theme of our, our time together this morning. And I, I just want to start uh, by just sensing the magnitude of this because um, with, with that many people all around the world considering this, um, this important theme, uh, I thought through the week the thought came to my mind, how did we get from having 12 tax collector, peasant fishermen, uh, a little rabbly mob of Jesus followers turning into um, one in every three people professing to be Christians? Um, and the answer, the answer to that question is the subject matter that we're looking at today um, because of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, I'm looking forward to, to, to getting into that. Uh, we, we're we're going to see that Jesus, uh, while he never wrote a book, uh, there's more books written about Jesus than any other person in the world. He never wrote a song, composed a piece of music, but there's more songs, and we've sung some of them today. There's more songs written about Jesus than any other person in the world. He never, did a pe never created a sculpture or painted a picture, but he's influenced um, more art pieces than any other s figure in history. Uh, the, the resurrection changed everything. The resurrection changed human history. And I really want you to feel the significance of that as we prepare to have a look at this. Um, I want to I just, um, again, before we get into the meat of the message today, I want you to just consider how unique the resurrection is. Um, you might not be able to see the font up on the screen here, but um, what you'll see is a little pictorial diagram of how Christianity started and and um, it, it's really unique, and I want to just make this point very early on as we start. Uh, all of the central claims of Christianity are claims that can be investigated throughout history. Um, we, when we look at how Christianity started, we saw that um, Jesus had a public ministry. He went and publicly taught people. Um, he publicly ro rose from a tomb, and he showed himself to the public. And then the public went and told everyone what they had seen and experienced. Um, all, all of these events are able to be historically verified and, and they ask, they, they demand for us to look at them and to, to see um, because we can verify them, they're in recent history. Uh, whereas every other religion, every other um, world tradition in the world is uh, formed, and I'd invite you to have a think through this perhaps at another time, is, is formed on a, a much different, ba much different basis, um, either a private dream about God, a private encounter, a private idea, and that one person went and told their followers. Um, that, that's significant because uh, when we have a, a public event and a public thing that can be historically verified, it opens up the, the possibility of being proved false. For example, let me paint this picture for you. If I was trying to paint, uh, start a religion, whether it be false or, or deceptively or true, I would not um, tell you that um, all of the details that related to it. I would not give you specific times and people involved and places where it was going to be. It wouldn't make sense because you could go and verify that and see whether what I was saying was true. And um, just as a, a means of illustration, for example, if I said to you that in 1965, there was a man by the name of Boris who lived on the Gold Coast. He traveled across to Bali. Um, he preached and worked miracles and gained a, a large following. Um, and the president of Indonesia executed him. And uh, it happened on the 13th of January, 1968, at 9 a.m. in the morning. I, I, this, I wouldn't tell you these sorts of things. 
because you would go and verify that in history and it would be easily falsified. Um, and that is the exact reason why religions, as we look around them around the world, don't have their central claims based in historical events because uh, they would demand historical inquiry. Whereas, with the one exception of Christianity, and the reason I believe that Christianity has been able to... Um, and I'll, I'll also add... Uh, the, those claims, uh, the claims of Christianity were being perpetrated in the first century um, when the people were alive and could investigate them at that very time. Um, and, and even now it invites us to look and see whether, uh, whether the claims of Christianity are true. And that's significant. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's something that Christianity exposes itself to that other religions don't. Um, so... I want us to uh, just really appreciate this morning the significance of the resurrection and the significance of the events that we're going to be looking at today. Um, now, I've entitled my sermon today the I've entitled my sermon today the darkest, brightest day in history. Um, we're going to have a look at what exactly that means, um, but we're going to spend our time looking at how. Um, through the, the life events of Jesus, his death and resurrection, um, he, he was able to transform and affect uh, our history in a way that has dramatically changed everything since that time. Um, Paul, Paul the Apostle said that uh, the, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and our faith is also empty. Um, without the resurrection, without the, the events that we're talking about today and that Christians around the world are considering and, and dwelling on, uh, Christianity would be nothing. So I'm excited, I'm looking forward to it. I want to start uh, by sharing with you a story. Now this is a true story. There's a pastor in South Africa by the name of Pastor Bright. And um, this story was actually published in a, ch in a church magazine um, a number of years ago. And I want you to think what you would do if you were asked to visit a condemned murderer three days before his execution. What would you do if you found yourself in that sort of a situation? This is the situation that Pastor Bright found himself in, and he had three days to approach these gentlemen. There was three of them who were, tri they were facing execution in a couple of days. He went to them, visited them, and he suspected that because their death was very soon, they would perhaps be open to considering other alternatives to the way that they've lived their life. But he walked into their prison cell, all three of them just spurned him. Oh, get away with you and your God. Get away um, you know, he can't save us, we don't have time for that rubbish, and Pastor Bright went off. Um, he came back the next day and he got the exact same response. The third day he came, and he saw one man um, in the corner just shaking, broken down in a corner, just shaking with terrible fear, and he was overcome with the fear of death. And Pastor Bright walked up to him and saw that he... Uh, he saw something in his eyes that was different to the other days, and he asked, can I speak with you? And he said, yes. And um, Pastor Bright opened up his Bible to Luke chapter 23 and the crucifixion account where there was two, uh, three, three other people being executed, um, where there was Jesus being executed on a cross and also a criminal who looked um, on and saw and was convinced through the way Jesus acted and behaved that Jesus was the Messiah. And and um, in, in Luke chapter 23, um, Jesus says to that, that criminal, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And he shared this with the, the man who was about to be executed. Um, and, and the man who was being executed was, was like, wow, do you think that God could forgive a murderer like me, like he did that robber? Um, and Pastor Bright turned in his, in his Bible to, to Psalms 103, where it says that, um, he's able to separate your sins from the east to the west. And he turned in, in rep to the text in Revelation chapter 20 where it says, um, Blessed are those who rise in the first resurrection, for they will not taste the second death. And he was able to encourage him. And um, this man, who was condemned to die the next day, um, prayed one of the most powerful prayers that Mr. Bright's, uh, Pastor Bright said that he'd experienced and heard before. And he committed his life to God. That next day he went to the execution uh, the, the execute was due to be hung, and he requested again to be able to pray before he was executed. He prayed to, as the those involved in the process. He was a witness to them, and and he um, and he was executed. 
his funeral uh, was in the prison room and a number of the prison guards came along to that a few uh, weeks or two later and Pastor Bright went and shared his, um, again, the story that he had shared with that criminal and um, three of the other pr- prison guards uh, accepted the Lord as their saviour that day as a result of the witness that the executed man had, had, um, had, had how they, they heard and saw the transformation in that man's life and what the story of the cross did in his life, how it changed him from a shivering, whimpering man in the corner to one who walked with hope and confidence and stood at his execution um, with, with confidence and joy. And that is the power of the cross. That's the power of the resurrection. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Um, the, when Jesus was on the cross, it was the darkest, brightest day in history. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing, um, having a look at this in more detail. Uh, if you could turn your Bibles with me to Genesis, we're going we're gonna to have a look at where this all began. Uh, the, in order to understand the significance of the cross, we need to understand why the cross had to take place. Um, it's really important that we understand why the cross was actually God's only option if he wanted to simultaneously save humanity um, and keep their free will intact. So we need to have a look at this. So if you can turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Uh, Genesis chapter 1. We're going to just have a brief survey through Genesis chapter 1 um, and 2 and 3. Uh, We read um, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 31... Uh, we see that in the creation account, uh, God created everything perfectly. There was nothing uh, that was out of place. Everything had its spot. It was all perfect. Um, but when we look at the, round, the world around us today, is that the world that we find ourselves in? No. We, we, the, there's suffering. There's pain. Clearly something changed in the picture. And uh, the, the something that changed is, is what we're about to turn our attention to um, it's the world that we see now is not the way God created it, it's not the way He designed it, it's not the way He intended it, and He doesn't take responsibility for it. Uh, so we're going to have a look um, at Genesis chapter 2, and I'd like you to have a look at um, verse 8 and 9. We see in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, God's giving us a little bit of a picture of what the garden looked like, and I think this is pretty cool. Genesis chapter 8 and 9, He says, uh, I'll put it up on the screen as well. Um, Gen- he said, uh, The Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This garden was epic. Uh, but, you know, there was uh, rivers and trees, everything that was pleasant to the eyes. It was, uh, it, it was a, a perfect position to be in. Um, but more important than just the physical beauty of the place was... God's presence and the fact that Adam and Eve were able to communicate with God as they would a friend, as they, they walked in the garden and they talked with him. And they operated in that, pre, um, in, in that garden of Eden, they operated on the principles of God's kingdom. They were, they cared, they were others-centered, they acted out of love. And this sort of environment is, is um, what we can look forward to returning to. But uh, had they not have sinned, um, Adam and Eve could have gone on in, the, in this position for, for um, all of eternity. Um, but their, their life that God had gift them, gifted them with was determined, was conditional upon them staying connected to the source of life, which was God. And we're going to see that they, uh, they didn't, weren't able to do that. Um, just have a look down at Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 15 and 17 also, just to further paint this picture in a little bit. In 15 and to, through to 17, um, we see that, uh, it reads this, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And God, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will die. In order to ensure that their love for him was voluntary and that they uh, were not coerced or being forced in a position of um, response to God, God created the tree of knowledge and good and evil and put it in the garden so that humanity could have a choice if they wanted to, to decide independently and away from God. It wasn't his desire that they would do that, but he, 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 um, he, he allowed this situation to take place in order to preserve human free will. And uh, what we see is that uh, 
he carefully spelled out the conditions on which that they needed to, uh, on, on which they would lose their life. He said that um, the tree of knowledge of good and evil you cannot eat from, um, and when you eat of it, you'll you'll surely die. So we see the situation getting set up, and of course. Uh, Moving, as we look through the book of um, Genesis and as we further progress, what we see is, um, as he often does, the devil trying to contradict and um, misinterpret what God says. And in Genesis chapter 3, if you want to cast your eyes over to Genesis chapter 3, um, in verse 4, we see um, the deceiver, the great deceiver, saying the exact opposite. Um, it says, Then the servant said to the woman, You will surely not die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, of this fruit, you will, your eyes will be open, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Um, what follows is perhaps the saddest part of Scripture. Adam and Eve believe the lie that Satan has painted them at this point, and they take the fruit. And as soon as they take the fruit and choose independence from God, as soon as they take the fruit and disobey His instructions, they start to immediately feel the effects of sin. And we see that straight away, the first response, and if you have your Bibles, you can just look there in verse um, in verse 7, the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. They knew that they were naked. Uh, previously they were naked and they didn't know they were naked. Now they knew they were naked. This is a biblical way of saying that they, for the first time, began to feel self-consciousness. They began to think of themselves and consider themselves, whereas previously they'd been thinking of others, the other. Um, they'd been operating on the principles of God's kingdom. As soon as sin entered the world, straight away we see the principles of God's kingdom being put aside and self-centeredness start to creep into the human race and they were naked and they knew it. They were self-conscious. But that's not all. Verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Where previously as God walked through the garden, that would be the sound of joy to them. They'd run to, to see God and, and talk and converse with Him. This sound now was a sound of something to be afraid of and something to, something to fear, um, something that had turned from a good thing into a bad thing. And the, the reason is because they were feeling the effects of sin, of guilt, of shame for the first time. I can't imagine what that would, would have felt like um, for the first time experiencing that sort of thing, having previously been in a position um, of, of perfection with God. Wow. Wow. Um, what we see as a result of this taking place in verse 19, if you want to turn your eyes across to chapter 3, verse 19, we see that, um, we see that they are given a sentence. In verse 19, the second half there, it says, um, for, till you, um, for out of the ground you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Uh, we, for dust you were taken, from dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Uh, we see that after Adam and Eve transgressed God's commandment, as soon as they decided independence from God, they discovered that the wages of sin, the result of sin, is actually death as God had said it would be. Um, and after giving this sentence, if you look in verse 21 through to 24 there, after giving this sentence and banishing them from the Garden of Eden, um, we, uh, God's actions uh, demonstrate what He does. It says, verse 121, verse 21 through to 24, it says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the, then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put his hand and take of the tree of life and eat and live forget, forever in his sinful state, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from where he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden. Um, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. God's actions at this point are making it clear that the immortality that Adam and Eve were experiencing in the Garden of Eden, the conditional immortality that they experienced, um, was lost through their disobedience, and that they now were mortal. They were now mortal beings, and they couldn't access the tree of life anymore. They were mortal beings, they were subject to death. And, and, and because Adam and Eve couldn't pass on what they didn't have, that transferred to all of humanity. Um, and I want to I make a point here. And I want us to consider this point, because it's a very important point. Sin never pays. Sin never pays off. God never asks us to do anything that would be in our essence our best interest 
not to do. He, he never asks us to do something or ask us not to do something unless it was in our very best interest. That's the only reason God would ever ask you to do anything or not to do anything. Um, and I want you to think, consider this. Uh, who is happier? The person who is trustworthy and as a result, um, who is honest and trustworthy and as a result earns the trust of those around them or the person who's dishonest and a liar and so people don't trust them and, and don't um, spend time with them. The one who followed God's law, the one who, who breaks God's law, the one who follows God's law, of course. Um, who has the larger capacity for fulfillment? The couple who uh, are loyal to one another and as a result grow closer in deeper layers of intimacy and trust or the, the, the couple who violate each other and have extramarital affairs? Um, who's happier out of this, this situation here? Um, who's more free? The person whose emotions are angry and whose actions are violent, or the person who has no ill will towards others. Everything that God asks us to do is for our best interest. He wouldn't ask us to do anything that would be better for us. We need to actually come to terms with what that means in our lives, because we have a habit of thinking that we know what's best for us, and we think that we know even better than what God knows. Uh, but what Scripture is telling us is that sin never pays. You might think that there's a situation where it can be justified, where you can explain it, um, where there might be a, a, an opportunity that, you know, maybe God was wrong here. Sin never pays. Um, every single time it will end you up in a situation that's worse off. In Proverbs 16.25, it says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to destruction. Um, in Psalm, uh, Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Don't, don't lean on your own understanding. Don't trust your own heart. Uh, sin never pays, and if in doubt, trust God. That's, that's the clearest way forward. And Adam and Eve certainly learned that. When they took of the fruit, they thought that it would be for their best interest. They believed Satan's lie that, yeah, maybe this will make us better. They took it, and of course, um, they were... It wound them up in a situation that was far worse off than what they originally thought um, would, would take place. So I want us to just, um, just consider that. And what a tragic account that we've just looked at. Um, it was only God's mercy that kept Adam and Eve from dying immediately. From the very moment that Adam and Eve took the fruit and ate it, um, God stepped in and the, the plan of salvation was put into action. And God said, I will take their place. And we can see that typified in verse 21 there of chapter 3. It says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord made them tunics of skin and clothed them. What we're seeing here is the very first object lesson, um, a brutal object lesson of the effects of sin, um, where Adam and Eve were able to experience for the first time that sin actually results in death. And Jesus was going to take their place, but an innocent lamb had to die as a symbol of what, that would, um, what, of what Jesus would do. And um, Revelation 13.8 uh, says, The lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Jesus was that lamb slain from the foundation of earth. He stepped forward and he said, I'll take their place. And, and um, that it's only through God's mercy that they weren't killed right then, that they had lost their life right then. So I want to ask the question, was this story, Adam and Eve, was this account an isolated event that happened thousands of years ago that has no bearance on us today? Definitely not. Definitely, definitely not. Um, Romans chapter 5 verse 18 says that through one's man offense, judgment came to all men. Um, because of um, Adam's position as the figurehead of, our, of humanity, we've all experienced and been tarnished with the, 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 the brush of sin. And I want you to just consider this, this diagram here. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, um, tells us that we've all fallen short of the glory of God, every single one of us. Every single one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. Um, we've all sinned. And Isaiah 59, 2, tells us that our sins separate us from God. They put a breach between us and God. Um, and where God is over here, and man is over here, the separating factor is the sin in our lives because we've all sinned and the sin separates us from God. Um, and Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. We saw that in Adam and Eve's experience as well. Uh, now, why, why would the wages of sin be death? 
That's a good question that's worth asking. Uh, it, it's, it's not by some arbitrary command of God over the top saying, you know, you've sinned, therefore you're going to die. Um, it, it's not an arbitrary, over-the-top judgment. It's the natural result of what takes place when life, the source of life, uh, when something becomes disconnected from the source of life, it's no longer alive. When you have a toaster, you plug it into the wall. If you to- pull the outlet, the, the plug out of the outlet, it's no longer going to run. When you pull something out of the source of life, um, which sin separates us from God, when we have sin in our lives, it, it pulls the plug out of the, the outlet and we're not co- no longer connected to the source of life and we experience death as a result of that. Um, it's, it's the natural consequence of, of what sin is and what sin does. Um, now, I want to make something very clear here. I'm going to have to find a wall. I'll try this one over here. Um, sin doesn't mean that uh, when we sin, God isn't moving away from us. I want to make that very clear. Um, it's us moving away from God. If I come and push on this wall here... Um, with all of my strength, I'm pushing, pushing, I hope you can see me, I'm pushing, I'm not pushing the wall away, as I push as hard as I can, the only thing that moves is me, and that's the same concept here with God, God is always faithful to us, He's always with us, Um, but as we, just like pushing on the wall, our sin pushes us away from God, and we're the ones who move away from God because it separates us from Him. And um, we experience, just like Adam and Eve, what did they do? When they experienced sin for the first time, they ran away and hid. God came looking. He says, where are you in the garden? And they ran away and hid. Um, sin separates us from God because it pushes us away from Him. Um, we do it to ourselves. And this gives us a picture of why the cross was needed. Because we're separated from God, and we don't have a way of getting back to Him. Um, you know, some, there's nothing that you can do in your own strength to bridge that gap. Nothing. Zero that you can do. People have tried it. Um, you know, you can try to be as good as you want. Um, try to get as much religion into your life as possible, morality. There's nothing you can do. It's all going to come short of getting across that bridge. The only, uh, the, there's only one solution. And I want to make this very clear here. Uh, This gives us a picture of why the cross was needed. The cross was God's method of breaching that gap. Um, We're going to have a look at a passage in John chapter 3.16. You can turn there if you like. If you know it, you can just consider it in your mind. Um, The solution to the the problem, the only solution, is Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross, the the subject that we're considering this morning. In John chapter 3.16, it says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Um, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. The solution that God had for the sin problem was His Son dying on the cross. Um, And I want you to consider this next statement. It's a powerful statement. It's a book from the Desire of Ages, one of my favorite books on the life of Christ. It says, Christ was treated as we deserve that we might be treated as He deserves. He was condemned for our sins, in which He had no share, that we might be justified by His righteousness, in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was His. By His stripes, we are healed. Amen. The closer you examine the cross, the more amazing, the more brilliant, the more stunning it becomes. And I want to just, um, Ellen White, one of the founders of the Seventh Adventist Church, says that um, it would be worthwhile spending a thoughtful hour every day contemplating these scenes, especially the final scenes of Jesus' life as we're doing now. Um, every day, it doesn't get old. Um, every day it would be worthwhile spending a thoughtful hour considering these subjects. Uh, so I want to spend some time examining now, um, having a, a deeper look at what this means Um, and having a look at uh, what exactly the significance is of the death that Jesus died. Um, So we're going to have a turn in Scripture. Can you turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20? Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. 
Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, we read that uh, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. This is the text that Pastor Bright shared with um, the the man who was in the prison cell, who was um, being prepared for the execution. Uh, There is a second death. If there's a second death, logically there must be a first death. And I want to explore for a moment uh, what exactly this text is talking about when it talks about the idea of a second death um, and how that compares to the first death and relates to what Jesus has done for us because it brings to light um, a beautiful picture of what God has done for us. Uh, So if you can turn in your Bibles once more to um, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 verse 28. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, uh, we get Jesus uh, explaining the difference between these two deaths, or uh, explaining to us what these two deaths are. And I'd like us just to take note of it here. In, In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, it reads, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So there's two deaths here. There's one death that can kill the body, but can't kill the soul. And there's one death that kills the body and the soul. Uh, this, th- this is Jesus unpacking and explaining to us what these two deaths are. And uh, it's going to give us a bit of a picture into what the, what the significance of the death that Jesus died was. Um, now I want you to just to illustrate this point. Um, I want you to just have a think with me. If someone went and, uh, and had a, a um, kidney transplant, would they still be the same person? They got someone else's kidney in their body? Okay. Um, what if they then went and got um, all, their artif- all limbs replaced with someone else's limbs and they got their stomach replaced? Would they still be the same person? But they've got a lot of pieces of the other people in them now. Okay, what if they got a heart transplant? and they got someone else's heart in them, would they still be the same person? You can transplant whatever you want into a person, and they'll still be the same person um, because uh, they still have their identity, who they are. And this is what this text is actually talking about here. Um, when, when the word soul is used, it's actually the Greek word psyche, which is the, the makeup, the, the, the identity um, of who the person is. And what Jesus is saying here as he delineates the difference between the two deaths is there's one death where just your, your body is destroyed. Um, but there's a, another death, the second death, where your body is destroyed, but also your psyche, who you are, your makeup is destroyed. Um, and, and, and he's unpacking for us the difference of what, uh, what, what these, these two deaths are, how they're different. Um, now, I want you to just see two passages that we're going to have a look at now that will help us to further understand the first death, and then we're going to make one application to Jesus, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll finish there. So if you can turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, verse 52, we're going to see a story here of um, a story where Jesus unpacks the significance of the first death, and he explains what this first death is. So we're, we're picking it up in Luke chapter 8, verse 52 and 55. Um, and now I'll just give you a bit of a, a rundown of what's happened before this. Um, Jairus is, was a man, um, who, a, an important man, who came to see Jesus, and he said, my daughter's sick, my 12-year-old daughter, she's on her deathbed, she's very unwell. And he said, come, please come and heal her. Jesus said, sure, I'll come along. This is all, these are the verses preceding the ones that we're about to read. And he comes along. He's held up in the process of getting to Jairus' house and that another woman um, reaches out and touches him and he's involved in another interaction. And um, at the end of this interaction, um, some of the servants of Jairus are sent to him and they say, look, it's too late. Your daughter's died. Don't bother the master anymore. She's dead. Um, So just let him be. Let him go his way. Um, And... This is where we're going to pick up the passage here. Luke chapter 8, verse 52. Uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 52. And Jesus went in and 
they, verse 52 there, it says, Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, Don't weep, she's not dead, but sleeping. And they all laughed and ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. She's dead, they know she's dead. Um, but he put them, them all outside, took by the hand the girl and said, Little girl, arise. Um, then her spirit returned and she arose immediately and he commanded that she was to be given something to eat. Um, Jesus said that she was sleeping. They mocked and laughed at her, uh, at him, and then he rose her from the dead. Um, there's another passage, and we won't turn to this one for sake of time, but I'll just, I'll just give you a little bit of a rundown. Um, uh, there's a second encounter where Jesus unpacks this first death, um, where one of his best friends, Lazarus, is, um, is dying. Um, and Jesus, uh, he's, he's, he's dying, he's dead. The disciples are wanting to take, um, you know, Jesus needs to go and see him. Um, but what, what takes place is that um, J- Jesus says that he's sleeping. And his disciples say, oh, well, you know, if he's sleeping, that's fine. He can get better, it'll be all good. Don't, well, let's not stress out about this going, you know, it'll be all good. And Jesus has to get really straight and plain with them. And he says, he, the Bible says that he said plainly to them, Lazarus is dead. Um, he had been using the term sleep, but then he just, he, he got over that and he just said, look, Lazarus is dead. What I mean by when I'm saying sleeping is Lazarus is actually dead. Um, so what we see in these passages is, is that Jesus identifies the first death as a sleep. Um, as, as a momentary um, position uh, where the body is, may be destroyed, but um, the, the person, who, the psyche, is just asleep. It's, it's, there's no consciousness. Um, so in contrast to that, we see a much different picture um, when we see the second death. And I want you to turn in your Bibles to this text in Matthew chapter 26. And this is where we'll spend... Um, the, the last bit of our time together. In Matthew chapter 26, um, this is the account in Gethsemane where Jesus is preparing to go forward to the cross um, and he's, he's with his disciples and he's ready to pray. Um, he, he's, he's, he's praying and he's asking his disciples to stay up and pray with him. We're in Matthew chapter 26. We're going to read from verse 36 and 42. Um, Let me just read it out. It says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter, the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Then he went a little farther and he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, O my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, What, could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray, lest you fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In in verse 38 there, um, Jesus said that his soul was exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Um, when we were back at that other passage, and it was talking about the two sorts of deaths, um, what was the death that related to the soul dying? The second death. The first death was the death where the body is destroyed, but the second death was the, the death where the soul and the body was destroyed. Here's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying. Um, Luke the Gospel of Luke tells us that at this point, Jesus was sweating te- uh, drops of sweat of blood. Um, this, at this point, no harm, physical harm, has been done to Jesus. And he says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Uh, Jesus is going through the process of dying the second death. Um, he's sweating drops of blood and he's experiencing psychological death. Um, uh, he's, he's experiencing separation with his father in a way that no other human has um, or needs to. And he's ex- experiencing a complete responsibility for sins, for the sins of the world on him. Uh, he, he, this, this experience calls him, causes him to, on the cross, cry out, My father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Um, because he f- just feels this separation. And I want you to notice as, as we close just this this last quote, um, it's another quote from the book, The Desire of Ages, and it just captures this scene right here um, and, and makes it so clear. 
It says, Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressed upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled with the soul of his son with consternation. Uh, all his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the, God, of the fa- Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, with the terrible weight of guilt that he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly even felt. Um, A couple of years ago, the movie Passion came out, and it, um, it... gave us a very clear picture of what Jesus' physical suffering on the cross was. But it didn't touch, didn't even mention his spiritual pain. Jesus died a death of spiritual separation of God. He didn't die from the cross and the nails. He died from being separated from God. He died from the result of being responsible for the sin of the world. And as the wages of sin is death. He died a spiritual death. Um, And this is what we see here. So great was his agony that his physical pain hardly even felt. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. He couldn't see beyond. Before he, at this point, Jesus had prophesied. He knew in prophecy that um, he was to rise on the third day. But at this point in time, his humanity was such that he could not see. He was sensing the separation from God so keenly that he could not see beyond the grave. He considered that he was dying an eternal death. Um, Hope did not present to him its coming forth from the grave, a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of his sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, was willing to give up his eternal life for you and for me. That's the second death. That's not the first death. He was willing to be eternally separated from God for our sakes. That's that's amazing. That that, that theme, that concept is worthy of our consideration today. Um, There is going to be an hour coming when all who are in the graves will hear Jesus' voice and will come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Everyone who has died the first death, the sleep will rise again. Uh, The second death is the equivalent of hell. It's the equivalent of eternal destruction uh, uh, of the soul and the body. It's the second death. Um, And that is the death that those who are in the second resurrection, the resurrection of the condemnation, will face although they need not face, because Jesus has faced it for them. And I want to make this point in closing. The death of Jesus for our sins bears a correspondence to the death of the sinner for his own sins, if the sinner will refuse to accept Jesus' death in his place. If anyone dies the second death, it will be because they have chosen it. They will have spurned the death of Christ and they will carry responsibility for their own sins. Jesus bore just such a death for us on the cross and conquered it. He didn't stay in the grave, he conquered it. He rose again so that we will never have to bear it ourselves. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to be here today. Um, and the opportunity that we've had to consider the, the great theme of salvation, um, the theme of your final moments on earth's history, your life, your death, and your resurrection, Lord. Um, We thank you that you did participate in that day, which was um, very clearly the the darkest and the brightest day in all of history. Um, Lord, we look to you as our surety, and we we claim the promise um, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, Thank you, thank you, thank you. We praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.